Good morning. Good to see you all. Good to see you all. Hey, why don't you uh, just stand for a moment? Again, we've been sitting for a wee while. We've been blessed in so many ways. So why don't you just one minute stretch your legs and uh, let me get myself set up as well. Bless you. Marvelous. There we go. Great. Brilliant. Aren't we blessed? Uh, we are having a wonderful, wonderful week together. Um, I had uh, another ap appointment last night, and uh, so I missed just the, the worship time, but got in for Peter's sermon. And uh, what a great word we had last night. Just uh, incredible blessing to us. And we are very blessed with the ministry. I know Jane blessed the ladies uh, yesterday afternoon. And uh, just, I, I think the quality of what's being shared right across the camp is just wonderful. So hopefully uh, from wherever you are coming from or wherever you are, that is being a blessing and an encouragement uh, to you. And it's a great, great joy and privilege to be able to share with you in this. Uh, I, let me just give a little testimony to, to bless Jim. Uh, I'm sure I have shared this with him. Um, but uh, uh, I, I used to uh, teach at Bible college and uh, one of the classes I used to teach in was Pentecostal church history. Uh, which was a great privilege to track the outpouring of the Spirit in perhaps a, a modern sense from the round about the beginning just before the 20th century and track the move of the Spirit right through the 20th century uh, and into the 21st. Incredible stuff and to see what God did in the most remarkable ways. And uh, in around about, of course, the 60s and 70s, there was a tremendous outpouring of the Spirit in what we might call a formal denomination. So people were getting filled with the Spirit from denominations outside of the Pentecostal family. Some of them were able to stay in those denominations. Some of them had to leave. Some of them were encouraged to leave. Um, and so there was a move of the Spirit that sort of uh, was coined in the phrase the charismatic renewal, really. Uh, and, that's, uh, and of course, Holly Bush was absolutely bang in the center of that for this country, and some of you will be aware of another stream of that, which was uh, entitled the Glory Move. And it has to be said that mainstream Pentecostal churches didn't respond very well to places like uh, Holly Bush or the Glory Move, if, if we're going to be really honest. And sometimes the treatment of what they saw as fringe charismatic groups uh, wasn't always as respectful as it could have been. I think that's fair to say, isn't it, Jim? So I, I think that's a fair summation without undressing anybody in the context of, of this world. Um, but of course, over the years, uh, because of my relationship with Dawn and different things, uh, I've come to know and appreciate and understand Holly Bush and, and really see its significance in terms of the charismatic history of the United Kingdom uh, and in the 20th century and further. And so I, I said to Jim, would you be prepared to come down and do a couple of lectures at Mattersea? And so uh, to a third year group, and of course Jim being Jim said, yes, absolutely, I'm up for it. Now, now Jim Wilkinson at Mattersea Bible College, um, it's either going to be glorious or it's going to be a car crash right there, right? It's, it's, it's going to be like heaven on earth or it's going to be purgatory, one of the two. There's going to be no middle ground here. And, and I remember just uh, the only piece of advice I presumed to give Pastor Jim was this, be yourself. Seriously, seriously, uh, and I mean, that, uh, I mean that genuinely. What I didn't want them doing was, was trying to come and be like super academic or clever or try to argue people into this. I wanted him to be himself to share because he is a genuinely authentic, spirit-filled man who lives in the life of the spirit. So I didn't, I didn't want a polished Jim. I want the Jim to come in and do what Jim does. And so I have to say, my blood pressure was a little bit higher that day as, as Jim arrived. And he came with a box full, it was Julie's testimony, box full of Miracle Valley books. <clears throat> and he came and did two lectures. And I have to say, look, seriously, he was absolutely brilliant. Um, and he was brilliant because he had the courage to be secure in who he was. And he had the courage to minister out of his strengths, which was this absolute confidence in the power of the Holy Spirit. He had walked this incredible journey a painful journey, glorious journey, and actually he was just absolutely brilliant. And by the end of the two lectures, he had the students eating out of his hand. <laughs> it was quite amazing. 
And uh, we opened it up for Q&A, and they, they couldn't shut up. They were just absolutely asking him all of these questions, and it was an amazing blessing. And one of the great blessings at the end was uh, he hung around, and there was literally a queue of students waiting to get the book, which is a sign he really did hit the mark there and, uh, and do that. And it was in my mind, of course, to keep Jim coming down, but uh, that, that sort of, uh, I, I no longer taught that particular series, so I, I couldn't invite Jim in. But what a blessing that was to introduce many of those young people, like Peter said last night, to a first-hand experience of the Holy Spirit and to someone who, uh, as it were, uh, messaged that and methoded that in the most authentic way. And uh, so I want to encourage that. The, 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 the branches and the seeds have scattered all over the place and lives are being touched by the power of God. And so in the line of what Peter said last night and what Jim continues to do, uh, may all of us grow in that grace. Amen? Why, why don't you give Jim a huge... Come on, give him a, a round of applause. Come on. First time I came to Hollybush, it, it was a, it was a, I came from a traditional Pentecostal uh, background, so we spoke in tongues. We were sort of evangelical plus tongues, really, in our Pentecostal church. So us getting excited was singing a verse of a hymn twice. Um, so when I came to Hollybush, I thought, I mean, Jim knows this, I've confessed all of this. I, I thought, I thought you guys were all on drugs. I, I thought it was bonkers. What? There were people running around the building. In our church in Belfast, the deacons would have just wrestled you to the ground. <laughs> filled you full of something other than the Holy Spirit and put you back in your seat. Um, so it was wild, absolutely wild. But I've come to love and appreciate this place. One other mother-in-law story I must tell you uh, from, from yesterday. My very first visit here, uh, where the young people are now, that was the main church, wasn't it, Jim? And Jim, again, so gracious. I was a, a third-year Bible student, and we, we turned up to the Sunday morning. Dawn, the, the, the woman of my dream, sitting beside me, uh, and then my mother-in-law. So I was sitting here. Dawn was sitting here. My mother-in-law was sitting I kept my mother-in-law at a distance. Well, she wasn't my mother-in-law then, so uh, mother-in-law to be. And so she was sitting on the end. And Jim, very, very, very graciously. I mean, I'm 19 years of age at this stage. You can imagine what that looked like. 19 and Jim comes to me graciously and says young man would you like to preach this morning no, no wait wait it gets worse um, and I heard my mouth say no now, now to be fair what I said was no I've nothing prepared right and Jim was about to graciously walk away and my mother-in-law to be leaned forward and she said, you will preach this morning. <laughs> so, my first experience of, of, of Holly Bush was not so much being moved by the Holy Spirit, <laughs> but being moved by the fear of a Welsh Celt. Um, and to be fair, I loved her daughter so much, I thought, if this is what's going to get me in, I'll do it. So, uh, let's get this done. All right then, praise the Lord. Well, look, we're, we're continuing this morning uh, this, this uh, theme of overcoming oil. And uh, again, thank you for the feedback uh, that we're getting. Uh, it's just a blessing to us. And I know some of this stuff's tough. And, and it's not exactly sort of happy, happy stuff. So I get this. This is tough stuff. But in the context of, of the whole week, I think when we're having joyous events in other places, I think sort of that slightly more sort of in your face in the mornings is we can cope with both can't we we can we can handle that a little bit so thank you for that so if you've got a bible why don't you turn with me to matthew 26 slightly longer reading this morning so we're going to push on to verse 56 of matthew 26 so while you're finding that matthew 26 we'll start at verse 36 while you're finding that just to remind you what we're doing we're back in the olive grove the name of that olive grove is Gethsemane, which literally in the language of Jesus means press oil or oil press. And it became synonymous because of the olive grove with olive press. So the idea was really that, you know, that this beautiful place was synonymous with the turning of the olive into the oil. And it, is, it cannot be a coincidence that 
Jesus Christ experiences one of his greatest pressing moments up to this part of his life in a place called oil press. I mean, it's had an incredible coincidence, or it's a God-engineered moment. And on Monday, we looked at the oil of submission, and we said this, that we asked the question, what do you do when you pray and God is silent? And so in the midst of the silence, Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. And under pressure of silence, Jesus allows the oil of submission to flow out of him. Because unfortunately, we only get the oil when something gets pressed. And there's no shortcut to this. That's the challenge of this. Then yesterday, we looked at the oil of strength. We asked the question, what do you do when your friends are asleep? Jesus returned to his friends, found them sleeping, and it says beautifully in Matthew, he left them there and return to the place of prayer. That moment of incredible compassion and strength. And we see there the oil of strength coming out of Jesus. He doesn't allow the fact that his friends are sleeping to distract him from his purpose. They've let him down. But he refuses to allow them letting him down to distract him from moving forward. And we talked yesterday practically about how to address those who didn't maybe necessarily mean to let us down, but have let us down. Yeah. Uh, for one reason or another, they've gone to sleep on the job within that. And we're, we're, we're eking out this idea that, uh, that the Father doesn't want to crush us, but he will bring us into moments where he presses us. And he's pressing us not to destroy me and you, but so that oil will flow from our lives. The enemy wants to crush us. Why? Because he wants your seed. But the Father wants our oil. And if we will cooperate with the Father, even in uncomfortable, difficult, nasty moments, we can see something of the oil of God's glory flow in us and through us to our world. And that's really the essence. So this morning we're going to move on and we're going to look at one more. The oil of steadfastness all right so that's what we're looking at today if you're making notes or following with me so back to our reading matthew 26 verse 36 and it says this then jesus went up with his disciples to a place called gethsemane and said to them sit here while i go over there and pray he took peter and the two sons of zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled then he said to them my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. And kissed him. Jesus replied, friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place. Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? 
But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? At that time Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion? You have come out with swords and clubs to capture me. Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all his disciples deserted him and fled. Wow. The name Judas is uh, synonymous with betrayal. Uh, even people who've never read the Bible know the name Judas. Uh, Non-Christians, people from a non-Christian background or non-Bible background are aware of this name. Uh, and every year, you know, we have the most popular boys' names in the United Kingdom. Top 10 list comes out of names most given to newborn babies. And Judas is never in the list. It's never there. So other Bible names are there. In fact, many, many people aren't even aware that they're giving their children Jewish names or Bible names. They're not even aware of that. They're just cool names. But Judas is never on the list. I've never met a Judas. Never met anyone called Judas. Now, there may be somebody out there on planet Earth, and you may have bumped into those, but 51 years of living, I've never come across anybody who was named Judas at birth. Why? Because he has become synonymous with a, one of the most treacherous and profound moments of betrayal in the history of the world. It's not just that he betrays Jesus, it's the way that he betrays Jesus. And the fact that he, his signal of betrayal is a kiss of greeting, referring to Jesus as rabbi, teacher, or even the first century may interpret that, master. And, and so there's something deeply dark and nasty about this moment. It's a really, really terrible moment. And I have read this passage hundreds of times for study and in my daily devotions. And every time I read it, I am deeply moved by the tragedy at the heart of it. A young man spends three years with Jesus and misses Jesus completely. What an incredible tragedy that is. I, I, uh, that, that for me is the greater tragedy even than Judas betraying Jesus. It's the fact that this young man experiences supernatural demonstration of the kingdom of God like it's never been seen on planet earth before. He hears the teaching of God's word by the word himself. Just a few hours before this, Jesus stooped down and washed Judas's feet in the upper room and yet we get this terrible moment of treachery and betrayal and it is a dark 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 moment remember Jesus in the olive press Jesus in Gethsemane is experiencing spiritual pressing emotional pressing psychological pressing and physical pressing and in this experience with with Judas uh, psychologically and emotionally uh, this is a massive massive moment Jesus has invested three years of his life into this boy this is not some kid off the street this is not some random angry person this is someone who eat with Jesus who slept with Jesus who saw the miracles with Jesus, who was sent out with Jesus' authority to declare the kingdom of God. This is someone who saw Jesus up close and personal. Someone who experienced Jesus' personal investment into him for three years, and now this man is betraying him. It's a deeply personal and painful moment for Jesus. And sometimes, because it's Jesus, and because Jesus is God, we sort of ignore or don't think about the psychological and emotional trauma that Jesus would have experienced in this moment. I know he knows that this has to happen. I know he knows that this is all part of a bigger plan. But think about it at a human level. Jesus took Judas into the depths of his being. Jesus shared his life unreservedly with Judas for three years. And now the same Judas betrays him. It's a terrible, terrible moment. And the pain of Jesus is heard in his own words. 
In John's account of this story, it says this. This is Jesus speaking. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Now, if you're aware of Middle Eastern imagery, there are two massive ideas in that verse. Number one, the sharing of bread. Which in the first century world, to share your table, to share your bread, was to share your life. It wasn't just have a cup of tea. It was an engagement with the person. It was literally opening up your world to that person. Table fellowship in the first century world was absolutely synonymous with sharing your life with people. That's why Jesus was criticized so much for having dinner all the time with sinners. Because it wasn't dinner. It was much more than dinner. That's why he was criticized. The second idea here in image, which some of you will be aware of, is the lifting of the heel. If you wanted to insult someone profoundly, even today in a Middle Eastern culture, you would show them the sole of your foot. If you really, really wanted to insult someone, and some of you will remember uh, the, the, sort of the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, some of you will remember a, a man taking off his flip-flop and throwing it at President Bush. And people say, well, it's a flip-flop. How's that going to hurt? Because actually, he wasn't trying to hurt him. He was trying to insult him. The flip-flop covers the foot. And the foot is the lowest part of the body. And if you wanted to insult someone, you would show them the sole of your foot. You would lift your foot to them. If you really wanted to insult their hospitality, you would leave their house and you would knock the dust off your feet from their house. And in fact, Jesus says that to his disciples. If you go to a village and they reject you and they, they treat you badly in terms of the kingdom of God, when you leave that village, make sure you knock the dust off the feet. Don't even leave their dust on your feet. It's, it's the most profound level of, of insult or, or rejection. So Jesus says, the person I've shared my bread with has lifted his heel against me. He's quoting there, of course, some of you will know, Psalm 41. And here's a wee clue for your Bible study. Anytime you see a New Testament author quoting an Old Testament passage, always, always, always go back to the original quote. And especially with Jesus, because Jesus often quotes the passage rabbinically. So what do I mean by that? Well, he doesn't just quote the text, he's quoting the nuance of the text. All right, we'll see this powerfully tomorrow in one of the most famous passages in the Bible. He quotes more than just the text, he's saying something deep from the text. So, so often a rabbi would quote the text because he wanted us to go back to the original text and study it. If we go back to Psalm 41, the pain of this quote is even greater. Look at this. Even my close friend, whom I trusted, who he who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Now Jesus hasn't misquoted Psalm 41. He has summarized it. That's a rabbinical practice. He just... He, he quotes the essence of the psalm, but everyone in that room, if they're aware of Psalm 41, will know what he means. And actually, Jesus is referring here to a deep, intimate, personal relationship that's now about to go wrong. And that's the very nature of betrayal. Betrayal is deeply painful because it's always deeply personal. If somebody you don't, you, you don't know betrays you, I mean, that's bad. But, but there's a sense of which, well, you know, that's how people are. But betrayal is deeply painful because it generally comes from a circle within your world. That's what makes it even more difficult. If it were from a random stranger, I can cope with that. When it comes from someone, a close friend, or someone you shared your bread with, or someone you trusted, it takes on a whole different dimension. Now don't rush past this, people. This is Jesus telling us, what's about to happen is going to be deeply painful for me. I've invested myself into this boy. I want him to succeed. I want him to go forward. I know there's a tension between you know, Judas the betrayer and Judas the disciple. It's all going on there, but Jesus is saying, he's my friend. I've shared my life with him. I've given myself to him. 
And before Jesus was a betrayer of Jesus, he was a friend of Jesus. Come on now. We can rush past this in Gethsemane. And it's interesting, in the Matthew account, when Jesus responds to Judas, he responds to him as friend. Yeah. Is that an accident? No, it's not, it's not a coincidence. Why? Because Jesus is alluding to Psalm 41. He's alluding to this moment. It's a friend who is betraying me. And that is a deeply, deeply painful moment. We can rush past it because it's Jesus. And because we've made up our mind on who Judas is, we rush past that. Well, it's just Judas. But remember, before Judas was a betrayer, he was a disciple. And before Jesus was betrayed by Judas, he was his friend. So that's all in the mix, in the backstory here. Does that make sense to you with me? Is that okay? Now I have to say all of that to set this up. So, so please forgive me for laboring that. But that has to be said to set the next bit up. Because people in the room have preconceived ideas about Judas and Jesus and the relationship. But we must see it in the context of this intimacy in order for the pressing to truly make sense for us. So, here's a little question. Why did Judas do it? There's all sorts of weird and wonderful ideas about why he did it. That he was a zealot and he was trying to force the hand of Jesus politically. The other, uh, of course, favorite theory is that he was just greedy for money and just wanted money. And therefore, he wanted to do a deal. And uh, there is value and validity, I am sure, in those theories. And I wouldn't want to push back too hard on any of those. But actually, my theory on why Judas betrayed Jesus is much simpler than that. It's much more human than that. I, and, but before, before, I, before I go into that, can I just say, look, when, when, when people betray us, when people hurt us, sometimes we want to know why. Why did you do that? Now, now listen to me carefully, pastorally, listen. There's a validity in asking why, because it can help. But sometimes, even when you know why, it's not going to help. Because knowing the reason why they betrayed you doesn't change the fact that they betrayed you. So, even if you know why, you've still got to address the betrayal. We'll come back to that in a moment. You've still got to address that. So people have said to me over the years, if I only knew why he did that, and I've said to them, that actually, that won't help. Really. Because, because even when we know why, we still have to address it. It doesn't make the addressing of the betrayal any easier because you know why. If that's been my experience. So, so don't make why, because you don't know why, an excuse to deal with this. We'll come back to that moment in a little moment. But it's worth asking in this context why, because there's so many theories knocking around. And this actually ties into what I'm trying to say in terms of the oil of steadfastness. So stay with me now. Uh, why did Judas betray Jesus? Well, I think the answer is found in a previous story in Matthew 26. In Matthew 26, and in Mark chapter 14, and in John chapter 12, there is a story of a woman who anoints Jesus for burial. And here's what it says. This is the context of Mark I'm quoting for you. A woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Now if you read Matthew, Mark and John on this, because Luke doesn't have this story, Luke has a different story, if you read Matthew, Mark and John on this, so Matthew 26, Mark 14 and John 12, you'll find this story. And you put the accounts together, here's what we discover. That actually Judas becomes deeply offended because of the woman's action. Something happens in this moment that impacts and offends Judas. And I, and I want you to see this now. This is really, really important. Uh, and we, we tend to think there's a big grandiose reason why Judas betrays Jesus. Well, it's to get Jesus to be 
to be the political messiah that he wanted to be and pick up a sword and fight the Romans. Or, or well, uh, it's because Judas is just basically a greedy person and he wants more money. But actually, the gospel suggests to us it's much more baseline than that. It's much more grungy and nasty than that. That actually, the reason that Judas ultimately betrays Jesus is because he was deeply offended by something. So what offended Judas? Well, let's break it down for you a little bit. First of all, if you read the story of the woman who anoints Jesus, in Matthew, Mark, and John's account, we'll discover this, that Judas was offended by her actions. Now how do we know that? Well, look at this. It says this. In Mark's version of this, it says, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And it says this in Mark, and they, that's the disciples present, rebuked her harshly. With me? So the implication for Mark is it's all the disciples who are having a go at this woman. But actually, when we look at John's version, John is much more specific. And John says this, but one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him, that's Jesus, objected. Okay? Now, now, now watch this. It's, the Gospel writers say the disciples objected, but John makes it clear it was Judas who led the objection. Now, one of two things that happen. There's no contradiction in the Gospels. There's, either, there's a, a clear explanation to help us here to marry the two accounts up. Either, number one, the simplest, simplest definition is Judas leads the charge and one or two of the disciples join in, which is like human nature. That happens, doesn't it? Somebody breaks the crowd and then the crowd instinct kicks in and, and, and they follow. So Judas objects and everybody goes, yeah, yeah, good idea, yeah, that's right, yes, absolutely, I mean. The other suggestion, which is a little bit uh, more difficult for us, is suggested to us by Adam Clark, and he said, in, in the context of the first century world, there was a, a sort of a literary device that, that sort of re- one person would represent the group without necessarily that group agreeing with that one person. So in other words, if somebody spoke from that group, you would say the disciples said. Even though it wasn't the disciples, it was one person. All right? Now maybe that's in John's mind. Remember, when John writes his Gospel, he's writing this significantly later than Matthew and Mark. And maybe John in his mind is thinking, I don't want to be associated with that objection. That's possible, right? I know that may be concerning. And maybe then John said, no, no, let me make it clear actually what happened that night. It wasn't all of us giving this woman a hard time. It was him. Judas objected to this. Okay? And what did he object to? He objected to the waste. So he says, he says, this could have been sold for a year's wages and given to the poor. That is so marvellous. What a, what a righteous sort of response. Well, Jesus, you know, it's great that you're getting anointed and the perfume's gorgeous, but we could have sold that and given. Think of the poor we could have helped. Think of the children we could have sponsored for compassion. Think of, think of the help we could have given to men. Uh, th- think of the things we could have done in the Philippines. Think of, think of the people we could have blessed around the world. It all sounds very noble, but it disguises one dangerous, dark reality. The man who was making the objection to the waste of perfume on Jesus was at the same time stealing from the money bag. Now, here's the irony. Jesus makes Judas the treasurer. Now, Jesus is a pretty good judge of character, we would want to agree. So it could be that Judas started off doing a good job, and then, you know, as the money starts to flow through the system, he sort of thinks I can just siphon off a little bit and keep it to myself. And and John's Gospel especially makes it clear to us that Judas was helping himself to the ministry money. So whatever money was coming in, Judas was helping himself. Isn't it funny, I've discovered this principle that people often get deeply offended by the issues of weakness in their own lives. I've seen that over and over again. People get really touchy about what you're doing 
And actually, often it's a reflection of something going on in me. You know, I, I remember famously a preacher who constantly preached against uh, pornography and people going to prostitutes, and who was actually going to prostitutes while he preached. It's a weird thing goes on, though. There's something in human nature that spots the stuff that sort of reflects us. So the self-righteousness kicks in. Your own vulnerability and your own weakness is deflected onto other people's failure. And whether that's happening with Judas, maybe it is, maybe it's not, but Judas is criticizing a woman's generosity while at the same time stealing from the money bag. Now maybe Jesus knows that. Maybe Jesus knows here what's going on. But Judas is offended by her generosity because miserable, sort of selfish, meager attitude people will always be offended by generosity. Seriously. They'll always be offended by it. Judas is offended by it. Why? Because he's a grabber. He's not a giver. And he's deeply offended by this. Now, now stay with me. We're, we're almost there in setting this up. He wasn't just offended by her actions. He was deeply offended by Jesus' answer. So here's how it's going down. She's anointing him. There's a reaction from the disciples, but John makes it clear it's Judas making the charge. And Jesus has one of his strongest rebukes to his young disciples. And here's what Jesus said. I'll give you the marking version on this. He says this, leave her alone. Now imagine this, if it's Judas leading the charge. Here's what I'm suspecting. Jesus isn't just speaking to the room, he's speaking to him. Yeah. Hey, you, leave her alone. Yeah. I'd love to think he did that with an Irish accent, because I think that would be really more effective. <laughs> leave her alone. Now, now insert into here the idea of Judas, right? Insert this. Judas, leave her alone. Judas, why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you'll always have with you, and you can help them at any time, but you will not always have me. She did what she could, and then he goes on to explain what she did. Now imagine, just just for a moment, let's just imagine Jesus is not just rebuking generically the room. He's not just saying to everyone in the room, hey everybody, leave her alone, chill out. But imagine if Judas is leading the line, Jesus directly and specifically looks this boy in the eye and says, who do you think you are? Leave her alone. I will not let you speak to her like that. Oh, and by the way, Judas, if you know the law, the law says you'll always have the poor. And you should be open-handed with the poor always, which we're being. Jesus quotes, in that little passage, he quotes Deuteronomy 15. Deuteronomy 15, 11. Uh, and if you don't understand the quote, it sounds like Jesus is saying, You'll always have the poor. Forget about the poor for five minutes. Sleep after me. That's what it sounds like. But the, he's saying the exact opposite. In Deuteronomy 15, 11, it says, The poor you will always have. Therefore, treat them with an open hand and be generous to them. So Jesus is quoting a law that says to Judas, Judas, why are you criticizing her for her extravagance? And why are you suggesting we don't give money to the poor? We do that all the time. The poor, we will always have Judas. And actually, you're in charge of giving money to the poor. So actually, the very thing he's criticizing her for, Jesus is now directly rebuking, and the very thing he's suggesting they should be doing, Jesus is saying, we are doing. There's something else going on here, Judas. This is not about money. This is not about person. It's about you. There's something going on in your heart. And imagine, now, now, now some of you may not, not want to go there with me, but imagine if Jesus said all of that to him. Not just to them. But he hits him right between the eyes. And he says, leave her alone, lad. Don't you put your hand on this. This is pure. This is holy. This is glorious. And I know what you're up to. And it's clear from John's gospel that Jesus knew that Judas was up to it. 
Now here's the grace of Jesus. He doesn't, he doesn't go further than he needs to go. He could have really made this personal. He could have taken Judas apart. He could have said to Judas, Yeah, by the way, we all know you've been siphoning off the money. So come on, man. Let's have it. But Jesus doesn't go there because he doesn't need to. Because he's not about destroying Judas. He's about saving Judas. He wants to save this young man. He doesn't want to push him. He doesn't want to save. He wants his oil. And if Judas will receive this rebuke, it will save his life. The tragedy for Judas is, it took his seed, not his oil. Look at what it says. In the very next passage in Matthew, it says this, Then, and in my Bible, the translators have put an unfortunate break in the passage. So you have the woman anointing Jesus, then they put this big title, and there's a break to the next verse. Take the break out. It's supposed to read and flow. So when Jesus rebukes Judas, when Jesus rebukes his disciples, it says, Then, In response to the rebuke, one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went out to the chief priest. Ladies and gentlemen, we can put it down to zealots and Romans and political shenanigans that why Judas betrayed Jesus. We can put it down to his love of money. Here's what I put it down to. He just got offended at Jesus. He didn't like the fact that Jesus dressed him down. He didn't like the fact that Jesus called him on the law. Come on, boy, you want to quote the law to me about the poor? Let's do this. He didn't like the fact that Jesus called him out in front of his friends. He didn't like the fact that Jesus exposed his stingy heart. Now, when, when, when a rebuke comes, one of two things are going to happen. You're either going to get better or bitter. You're going to go one of two ways. Someone gets in your face and says, your attitude sucks. You're either going to take that and say, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe I need to learn something. Maybe I need to grab this. Or you're going to go, who do you think you are? And it's the rebuke that can either bring us to freedom and life and safety, or the rebuke can actually drive us further into darkness. People have left churches because they've been rebuked. And the rebuke has, hasn't been to destroy them, the rebuke has been to challenge them. Jesus is in trouble. If Jesus had have wanted to strip this boy bare, he could have done a better job. He's not trying to destroy Judas, he's trying to save him. Judas, listen to me. Come here, lad. Stop this. Stop hiding behind this pious self-righteousness. Come close to me and you'll catch me. But instead of getting close to Jesus, it says, then, then, he left. When Judas was pressed, the moment got his seed. But John tells us that when Judas agreed to the moment of betrayal, Satan entered him. So when Judas is squeezed, pressed, the seed is crushed, the oil doesn't flow. Now I need to say all of that to set this up. Because this is really, really important in terms of how then Jesus reacts. What do we do when someone betrays us? What do we do when someone close to us does something we did not expect them to do. Yesterday we talked about maybe friends who were passive when we hoped that they would be active. Today we're talking about people maybe close to us who've done things actively that have hurt us. It's a slightly different thing, right? So a friend can just go to sleep on you and it's not that they're being deeply bad, it's just they've, they've gone to sleep. So it's not that they haven't done anything, it's just that they that has been passive in this moment. However, betrayal is not passive, betrayal is active. Betrayal is something they've done to us, which takes us to a new level. Jesus has to contend not only with friends that have gone to sleep on him, but now he has to contend with the friend who is betraying him. Betrayal, I would argue, is one of the most difficult presses to endure. 
And I think that's why we're giving the insight into Gethsemane, because Gethsemane shows us the darkest moment of betrayal, and yet Jesus' reaction to it that ensures the world still gets saved. Yeah. It is possible to survive betrayal. Well, let's hope so anyway. It is possible to find oil in betrayal. It is possible to find life in betrayal. It is possible to find victory over betrayal. It has to be. It must be. We hope that it is, because if it isn't, then every person in this room is probably in trouble. I would be. And actually, how do we respond to that deeply, deeply personal moment? Well, uh, here's, here's, from, I think, both the text and experience, here's, here's some suggestions. Sometimes when we're betrayed, we, we respond by retreating. What do I mean by that? Someone betrays you, and because of the pain, because of the hurt, here's what we do. We step away from everything. We back off. We back off the church. We, we back off Jesus, we back off the Bible, we back off the presence of God. All that stuff that Peter talked about last night, about going back to the presence of God, that's the last thing we want to do, because the last time we did that, the last time we served, the last time we gave, the last time we, we opened up ourselves up, somebody gave us a kicking. And so we, we retreat, we back away. Back away from the pain. I'm not doing that again. I'm not going there again. I'm never going to trust anybody again. I'm never going to serve anybody. I'm never going to make myself vulnerable again. No one's ever going to get my heart again. Now listen, I totally get that. That doesn't make you bad if you're in the group. That doesn't make you bad if you're in the group. That's just a defense mechanism. It's fight or flight. And in the moment, sometimes it's a trap, the reason for this is run. I'm just get out of here. I'm done with it all. I'm done with you. I'm done with God. I'm done with the church. I'm done with help. And I'm done with love. And I'm done with blessing. And people, I'm fed up with it. Every time I do it, I get the muck the end of the stuff. I'm done with it. And, and as we retreat, the moment of betrayal gets our seed. That's right. Come on. Peter says, we're by Jesus and he runs. And he said, it would have been different for him, at least in theory. Yes? Don't retreat. Don't do it. Listen, if you retreat, here's what happens. You sin. That's right. Yeah. They don't sin. That's right. Yeah. Your betrayal is not hurting because you're retreating. Right. You're not hurting them by retreating. I knew there wouldn't be many on the end this morning, it's okay. If we were to, it's a double win for them. Not only have they hurt you, but now you're on the run. And everyone you would have blessed won't get blessed. Every life you would have touched positively won't get touched. Every contact you would have served won't get served. Every child that you want won't get reached. And somebody else will reach him, because God's amazing, and he'll put someone else in there, but actually you and I won't do it. And, and we will have a valid excuse for this for the rest of it. Well, you hurt me. Get it. I get it. I get it. But here's a hard betrayal win when you run. Don't run. Don't run. If you're going to run anywhere, run, as the man of God said last night, into the presence of God. Don't run away, because when you stop running, you'll never stop. And once you get into the habit of running, it's the first thing we can do when pressure comes on. Run. Run. Don't look straight. But that is from Jesus. Did you notice in the story? Jesus doesn't look straight. He's not coming with I'm not running from you, Lord. I know why you're here. I know what's about to be done. I've tried my best for you, but I am not running from you. And I'm not running from that. I'm not running from my destiny because of you. Come on, man. The second thing that often happens as well, uh, do, do parents want to go? Can I do that now? Parents, if you need to go for your children, bless you. 
Thank you, Jesus, for this gift of my children. Yeah, it's beyond 
that doesn't fit into our world. Okay? Now let's give it carefully. If we don't take it, what he's offering can't be given. So Jesus is trying to betray Jesus, and all he does is betray Jesus into his destiny. And the reason that it doesn't work is because Jesus won't accept what Jesus has offered. So the situation with a thought can be given by someone, but there's another sense in which it's taken by us. What, what do I mean by that? If it's given, it's given, John. Yeah, I see it. But if you can take it in such a way that it becomes you, it becomes part of you. I've not accepted it. But if you, if you bought me a, a gift, and I took the gift off you, but I actually didn't really want that gift, and took that gift in my drawer, and never looked at that gift again, there's a sense in which you've given it, but I haven't really taken it. And I think Jesus is giving something, but Jesus isn't taking what Jesus is offering. Jesus is focusing on something beyond what Jesus is doing. And if we won't take it, technically, simply it can't be given. That's a deeply challenging idea. Here's a second idea, really quickly. If we take it, it goes where we go. So when Jesus leaves the presence of Jesus, he takes the offense with him. And everywhere Jesus goes, the offense goes. And, and if Jesus takes what Jesus is offering here, then it means everywhere Jesus goes, this is going to go. And he's carrying something with him. I think that there comes a moment where we have to recognize that if I take what the betrayer is offering, the danger is it becomes part of me. And then I take the seed of that offense, that hurt, that betrayer, with me wherever I go. And in every conversation, every relationship, every interaction, we just condemn to the conversation. Now listen to me. If you're still talking about him, you're not over him. John, but you don't know what he did. I, I get it. I get, I get it. Listen. But if you're still talking about him, you're not over him. You stay with us. He's walked in person in the words of Jesus. Jesus is never mentioned to him. This is that idea really quickly. If we take it, we'll end up giving it. Eventually, this will happen. And if I accept that the pain of the betrayal, eventually that will end up manifesting itself in some deep and profound way in my life. That's going to come out. And it may come out to my wife when you're all not looking. It may come out when I'm driving the car down the M1. It may come out in a supermarket. It may come out in the floor of the church. It may come out on a platform. But it's going to come out eventually. Why could it go there? And pretending it's not there is not dealing with it. No one's ignoring what Jesus did, but no one's accepting what he did. So, so actually, what, what Jesus did is powerful, but to the start of that now, but for actually no one's aiming with it now, no one wants to carry this idea on, it happens, and we've moved beyond it. We've accepted it, we've looked at it, we've addressed ourselves to it, but we're not going to allow that betrayal to infect us to such an extent that it ends up poisoning all the opportunities that God has for me as I go forward. Lastly, let me close with this idea. Don't take it. Defend it. What do I mean by that? Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them. 
what he's basically doing there is sending away the offense. Send it away. It's a fact. It's happened. You can't undo the betrayal. It's done. You can't go back in time and fix it. It's done. You, you can't rewind the clock and, and put it through the gate. It's done. But what we can do is make a decision that this moment will not define our future. The Judas will not define our destiny. The Judas will not master the direction of the day. We're going to make a decision that is going to be the day. I'm going to release Judas. I'm going to forgive Judas. I'm going to let Judas go. I'm going to place Judas into the hands of God and leave all of that to the Lord. And I'm going to focus on the destiny that God has for me. That's what I'm going to do. It's amazing. Absolutely not. This is not that hard. This is why we need the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to help us, because this is, this is absolutely super hard. This is, uh, in fact, uh, when it comes to forgiveness, uh, someone wants to say it's too difficult, but they, 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 they point it this way, so all is human to forgive is divine. That's not true. If forgiveness was impossible, we wouldn't be asked to do it. Thank you, God, for forgiveness of God.
we're making a decision to leave all of that to the Lord while we focus on going forward, while we focus on the presence of the Lord. By forgiving Judas, it's not an easy justice. By forgiving Judas, you're not ignoring what he has been doing. But you're just making a decision that what they did will no longer hold you or define you. If you can do that, the oil of steadfastness flows. And the Lord will do something in you that is truly transformational. Now really quickly, I know this is deeply sensitive, deeply difficult. But if you need to release the Judas, and you would like me to pray for you, then quietly, sensitively, you just stand to your feet. And let me do that right now. It's going to open us up for about 10, 15 seconds, because it's so specific. You know if it's you. A couple more seconds and you're going to pray. And there are folks standing in this room. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your humility and standing. Tough work today. But you're active standing to just have saved your people. You just represent the darkness that wants to take us down. But if you will have the courage to forgive Jesus, listen to me carefully now, listen to me. If you will have the courage to forgive Jesus, then all the Father will enable Jesus to do is call you and be a blessing. Ironically, the Father can take an act of the prayer and make it work for you good. Take an act of the prayer and turn it for his glory. And in Judas' wildest dreams, he couldn't have imagined what would happen because he saw this man into his destiny. But so much of it hinges on our response to Jesus. Now listen to me carefully as I'm about to pray for you. Forgiveness is not a feeling, it's a decision. Forgiveness is not about ignoring justice, it's about releasing process. Forgiveness is not about pretending you want the prayer, but it's about saying, I will not let the prayer defend me. And so you may feel absolutely nothing by the end of my prayer. But if you will have the courage to go from this place and say, I forgive you, Jesus. Then you are sin. Holy Spirit, for those wonderful people standing in this room, those that are standing represent the pain of the prayer. The pain of someone who shared their bread and lift up their heel against them. Lord, I pray that as they have responded by faith to this moment, that something of your grace, your power, your word, your truth, will flood their hearts and their minds, so that they will have both the courage and the faith to say to Jesus, I forgive you. I release you. I banish what you have attempted to do from defining my life. I pray that the pursuit of justice into the hands of God. And I make a decision that Judas will not have me, but the purpose of God will be fulfilled in me. Judas, I forgive you. Judas, I release you. Judas, I rise above you. Judas, I look beyond you. You are part of my past. You are not part of my destiny. 
So in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that the power of your grief, the power of your spirit, the power of your word will flood into the heart of every person, and that, Lord, from this moment on, they will go in power and authority and anointing to preserve the future you have for them and to live the life you've designed for them. I pray that, Lord, they will run and in glorious retaliation live their lives well. Live their lives for the glory of God. Live their lives in such a way that Judas' ambition to destroy them will not succeed. And it is tried to get their sin that you, O oh Lord, will cause all to flow from them. And so, Lord, I pray, your blessing upon each one of them. Lord, as they go from this place, protect the word of the Lord in their hearts. Feelings will arise in a few moments. Emotions will arise. Whispers will arise. In the name of Jesus, they come against every idea that will undo this faith. And in Jesus' name, we seek freedom. The freedom of forgiveness and the freedom of God's destiny. Why don't we all stand really quickly? Let me pray for you and dismiss you. Lord, let the oil flow, we pray. Let the oil flow. We don't want the enemy to get our seed. Father, we want to give you our oil. Father, we don't want to die in the garden. We want to live in your purpose. Father, we don't want to be defined by what has happened to us. We want to preserve your purposes for us. And so, Holy Spirit, help each one of us. And so, may the Lord bless you, and may he keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you. And give you peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. Enjoy your lunch. Have a wonderful day.